The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. It's common enough that there's now a term to describe money laundering in Canada, snow washing. Tonight, has this country become a haven for cleaning ill-gotten gains? Then, a half century later, we recall the greatest hockey showdown of all, the 1972 Summit Series. It's Thursday, September 22nd, and that's tonight on The Agenda. The U.S. State Department called Canada, quote, a major money laundering country back in 2019. And just this past summer, the picture of what that looks like became much clearer with British Columbia's so-called Cullen Commission, which detailed the millions of dollars being cleaned through casinos, real estate, and fake financial transactions of myriad sorts. With us now for more, in the nation's capital, Mark Tassé, forensic accountant and lecturer at the University of Ottawa's Faculty of Law, and at the Telfer Executive MBA program. And here in our studio, Sasha Caldera, Beneficial Ownership Transparency Campaign Manager at the non-governmental organization Publish What You Pay Canada, and Rita Tritcher, Senior Business Writer and Columnist for The Globe and Mail, and it's good to have you two here in our studio. Mark, good to have you on the line from the nation's capital. Sasha, let's put you to work right away. I think this is going to come to news, come as news rather, to many people that we are apparently a haven for money launderers. Are we really? You know what, Steve? Yes, we are. Um, so Canada has a AAA credit rating. We are a G7 country. Uh, we have a modernized international system of trade. Um, and that makes us incredibly lucrative to money launderers worldwide. The more stable of an economy you have, the more attractive it becomes to launder money. Uh, experts estimate anywhere between 45 billion to 113 billion is laundered annually each year. And this is known as snow washing, where in international marketing firms um, or inter international law firms have marketed Canada as a secrecy jurisdiction to incorporate a shell company for the sole purpose of uh, avoiding tax and to launder money. Now, Mark, I suspect most people know what money laundering is, but for those who don't, what's your best definition of what money laundering means? Uh, my best definition would be you take something that is illegal to get the profit out of it and then you recycle it into the economy but into something legit. So you take something which is totally illegal and you convert it into a legit activity by using, as Sasha was pointing out, the shell company and other operating companies too. And do you agree we're one of the big countries in the world where this happens? Oh, yes, we are. Uh, it's <laughs> not something that we should be proud of, but yes, we are. And do you also sign on to this anywhere from $45 billion to $113 billion? That's an enormous amount of money. Oh, yes, and uh, I would have no, no problem believing that it's probably closer to $100 billion than it is to 40-something 40, 40 billion. Uh, <laughs> it's only an estimate, but to be honest with you, it's really hard to come up with a clear number because it is actually illegal, so they're not disclosing it in financial statements, but uh, it's at least $100 million. It's very, very lucrative. Huh. Okay, Rita, we've got an organization in this country called FinTrack, which is supposed to keep an eye on this. What's FinTrack? FinTrack is our federal anti-money laundering watchdog. It is the financial intelligence unit for Canada. And it collects um, a lot of information from banks and other uh, reporting entities on suspicious transactions that take place. So it's, it's a data collection agency um, to a large extent. So a bank, for example, if it notes a transaction uh, is suspicious in some way, It'll write up a report, it'll send it to FinTrack, and FinTrack, uh, you know, is used by law enforcement. The information that they provide is used by law enforcement to prosecute these cases. And what would be something that would be considered suspicious? How is it suspicious? I mean, there's, uh, it's pretty broad definition. I mean, anything can be considered suspicious. I mean, there's a lot of talk of, you know, if a transaction is over $10,000, it is automatically flagged to FinTrack. That's true. But a bank doesn't necessarily have to wait for uh, somebody to cross that $10,000 threshold. Anything can be considered suspicious. FinTrack collects a lot of data. 
Um, millions and millions of reports go to FinTrack every year. But there is a question, and this was addressed by the Cullen Commission, you know, there is high volume reporting to FinTrack, mm -hmm. but how effective is that re reporting? Well, I was just gonna ask about this, and I guess we should do a little background first here. The Cullen Commission, named after a former British Columbia politician who's heading this uh, study in BC, what were they supposed to look into, Sasha? For sure. Uh, so the commission was supposed to look into uh, the extent of money laundering in the province of British Columbia. Uh, more notably, uh, this discovery that uh, money was being laundered ab from abroad uh, in through uh, Vancouver casinos and then ending up into Canadian real estate. Um, and the commission was supposed to understand to what extent this is impacting the economy and also uh, how it's impacting public safety. Did they do a good job? You know what? Uh, I think after three years of hearings uh, in which our coalition was a witness, I think they uh, examined the issue very thoroughly and there are some excellent recommendations overall. Um, whether they can be implemented, it remains to be seen. We'll look into those in just a moment. Uh, I guess I should ask you, Mark, whether you think FinTrack is doing, you know, Rita said they get, uh, what was it, thousands millions, and millions, millions, millions of reports every year that they're supposed to look into. Are they able to do that? Well, I, I do think they, they do their best, but I'm quite sure they're not able to process every suspicious activity report they receive. Uh, as Rita was pointing out, we're, we're talking millions of reports, and they don't have so much staff. Even though now with artificial intelligence, if we're using the technology, uh, it can actually be speed up. But still, there is a lot to do. And the problem is, once the financial institution file a suspicious activity report, until it comes back to say if it was uh, there's a problem or not, sometimes they continue doing transaction with those clients, which is a big issue. The, because as soon as you file a suspicious activity report, logically we would think that you would not continue doing business, but sometimes they continue until they wait from the answer from FinTrack to tell them it's, if it's okay or not. I guess I'm trying to figure out, Rita, whether FinTrack, because it is so. It puts so many reports forward, whether they are or they've received so many reports, whether they're just simply overwhelmed and can't really investigate. They, I mean, they're never going to get to the bottom of this because they're just overwhelmed with reports all the time. Is that right? Uh, well, I mean, for suspicious transaction reports, they received uh, just under 400,000 last year, but there are mm -hmm. millions more of uh, different kinds of reports that they receive, you know, cash transactions, large transactions. There's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. there's there's a huge volume of information that comes into FinTrack. They can only also operate uh, within the confines of the legislation, the governing legislation. So one of the restrictions that the, it, they have on on them is that they cannot ask questions of the banks about the information that they receive. They can't go back to a bank, for instance, and say, hey, so-and-so bank, that was a very interesting report that you sent us about Client X. What more do you have on Client X? Now, why can't uh, they do that? Because the uh, legislation is written in such a way that it operates as a one-way um, receipt of information. It can't even you know, comment to the banks on the quality of the reports that they produce. So the banks are in a position where they have to uh, submit a report for each and every suspicious transaction. And then police are left in the position of trying to connect the dots. Sasha, why would you write a law trying to get to the bottom of money laundering when you're going to handcuff the investigators this way? <laughs> well, this is always the, the, the issue with money laundering, and it's trying to discern between protecting the rights um, of, of privacy, but also rooting out secrecy. And uh, I think what Rita described here is one of the, is one of the tensions between those two. Um, you know, looking, looking at the legislation itself and looking at FinTrack's ability to share information with banks, I think, this, uh, I think there's an opportunity uh, for banks to seek an exemption uh, from uh, PIPIDA, for instance. PIPIDA? Uh, uh, the Canada's privacy uh, legislation that sort of is uh, prohibiting banks from sharing information between one another. Hmm. So, you know, I think there could be an opportunity um, in the case of sp suspicious transaction reports if banks can share this information um, about suspicious clients amongst one another, or whether FinTrack can be enabled to notify banks when a bank reports an STR regarding STR? Uh, a suspicious transaction you report. You do love your acronyms, don't you? Uh, uh, my apologies, my <laughs> apologies. And, uh, you know, so um, there, there, there's room to modify uh, Canada's privacy legislation so it's effective and we can uh, address the secrecy aspect while protecting privacy. Mark, how effective do you think these laws are to help FinTrack get to the bottom of what they're trying to get to the bottom of? 
Well, I think they need to be changed because right now they're not effective. Uh, it's, a, it's really hard for FinTrack to do their job. And it was actually pointed out in the Cullen Commission. And, and, and I do think that there need to be a change. Uh, there need to be a will for a change also. This is something that has to be taken seriously. But uh, the timing cannot be better. So I do think that uh, at least they will review the law. And I hope, and hopefully they will actually change it to make it uh, easier for FinTrack. Do we need a situation, Rita, whereby banks can actually talk to each other about suspicious transactions that they may all be in on, if I can use that expression? Absolutely. I, banks have requested what is known is, as a safe harbor provision. So basically what that means is it would protect the banks from legal liability, from uh, being sued effectively if they were to share confidential customer data with, uh, with each other uh, in cases of money laundering. So they want this. Right now, the privacy legislation that Sash talked about does have a carve out or um, you know an exemption in cases of fraud. So in those cases, banks are allowed to share a limited amount of information with each other, and that's because fraud is often considered the predicate offense for money laundering. But there can be other predicate offenses for money laundering. I mean, you could have cybercrime as an example. Mm. So right now, U.S. banks have this ability to share information with each other um, in cases of suspicious activity. How come they do and we don't? Well, because the Patriot Act, you know, more than 20 years ago, gave them this ability. And last year, FinCEN, which is a, an arm of the U.S. Treasury, gave banks new guidance which said, you know, you don't actually have to wait until you have a, a definitive, you know, conclusion that it, it is suspicious activity. You can share information with each other uh, when there are even attempted transactions that are aborted because it can lead to a pattern of behavior and it can help better identify trends. So banks in the U.S. Um, have been given more leeway to share information with each other, which is very important, because Canadian banks are expanding more and more in the United States. And in mm. fact, the Department of Justice uh, in the United States has new subpoena powers where they can basically go to a foreign bank, like a Canadian bank with operations in the US, and subpoena them, subpoena them for records uh, for accounts that are held outside of the United States. Mm. So we can't afford to have a gap in Canada uh, when the US is moving um, in, in this direction. Sasha, can you just give us some sense about what kind of customer data the people who are involved in this want to keep private, but that the banks might actually want to share with each other? Yeah, for sure. So um, there could be um, very, uh, very sensitive information, particularly um, in regards to uh, citizenship, for instance, or um, uh, other personally identifiable information um, that, you know, people are entitled uh, to, to, to keep as private. Um, and um, uh, with respect to information sharing, we just need to be careful that, um, that the information uh, is shared amongst competent authorities, uh, mm -hmm. that banks can access it or uh, law enforcement. And, um, and we have legislation that allows our competent authorities to do the job of, of investigations. Now, there, Mark, there's two issues at stake here. Obviously, there, there is a requirement of some privacy for legitimate transactions, that kind of thing. Whereas there's also a requirement that authorities who smell malfeasance, they have to be able to get to it. Where is the pendulum at the moment swinging between those two obligations? Um, I would say the problem is the fact that they, they have issues obtaining information that are relevant. They obtain a lot of information, but sometimes they are not relevant because of the fact that some people are using nominees. Uh, so you don't know who is the ultimate beneficial owner. So you might be gathering information, but the information you gather does not actually uh, become really relevant because it's only a nominee. So it's not the real beneficial owner. Hmm. And unfortunately, sometimes the nominee will be a lawyer and then the lawyer will not disclose to you who's the beneficial owner because of the solicitor client privilege. So that becomes the, the, the problem for the agencies. But it sounds, Mark, like the United States is much further ahead than we are in terms of being able to crack down on this kind of money laundering. Do, do we need to, like, do we need to take some lessons from them on this? 
Oh, for sure. For sure. We need to collaborate. We need to, to listen very closely to what they're doing and we need to uh, replicate it. Uh, that's one thing for sure. They are ahead of us, as Sasha was pointing out, that they have invested a lot of energy and time. And I do think that we need to, we, we cannot afford not to be there with them, not to be by their side, because otherwise we're going to attract people who want to, will want to avoid the U.S. and come to Canada. And hmm. that will create big tension. Well, Rita, can I put a bit of a suspicious hat on here for a second? Is there a disincentive for governments to want to get to the bottom of this? Because in effect, when you're doing money laundering, you are, I guess you're actually getting more money circulating in the economy, which at the end of the day could be good for governments. They'll realize more tax revenue, etc. I mean, these are important questions that the government should provide answers to. I mean, what is the holdup? We've known for many, many, many years that Canada has been lagging on this issue. But, you know, more importantly, the black economy isn't a stable economy. This is not a plan <laughs> for economic growth. Um, and, in fact, the United Nations talked about how the recovery from COVID-19 could be put into jeopardy um, if we do not tack it, tackle the illicit uh, money flows that are circling all over the world. Do you see that, Sasha, that there's a disincentive actually for government to get to the bottom of this? You know what? There, there's actually an incentive, I, I would say. and um, There is an incentive for them to get to the bottom of it? Absolutely, because... Um, Here's why. This money, as Rita mentioned, um, it doesn't help our economy. This is mo these are funds that don't belong in Canada. They are either stolen or they're generated from the proceeds of crime. They create capital markets risk. They contribute to fraud. They contribute to um, drug trafficking, weapons trafficking, human trafficking. Uh, it could cause uh, invest good investment to flow out of Canada because it increases Canada's perception of political risk. But it probably buys a lot of stuff. Too, doesn't it? <laughs> you know what? This money is not as lucrative as it might seem because the, the nature of money laundering is to simply uh, be integrated in, into an economy and then it goes out the other door into an, in, 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 into an international tax haven. So mm. this is money that is short term and um, given the public safety risks and the economic risks, it's not a good bargain for, the, for any government to deal with. Mark, what's your view on that? I totally agree. And I think the big issue is the fact that uh, economists would probably say to you, no, we think it's a good thing. But as Sasha and Rita were pointing out, it is not. And one big issue that we have we realized is that when they invest in real estate, they usually invest in high rise. The problem is when you need to build infrastructure when there is a lot of booming high rise everywhere in the city. The problem is about 35 percent of those high rise uh, are vacant. People are not living into it. They're just an investment. So therefore, you build the infrastructure for nothing. So at the end, it's the taxpayers who ends up paying for those infrastructure that are not used, restaurants that are not operating at full capacity because of the fact that 35% of those units are, uh, are vacant. Interesting. Okay, well, let me, let me pick up on that. Rita, do you have any sense about how much money is being money laundered through the housing market right now? I mean, there was one estimate from 2019 out of British Columbia. This is one from one of the reports that laid the foundation for the Cullen Commission that $5 billion was laundered through BC real estate alone in this one year. Um, $5 billion in one year, most of it in Vancouver, presumably. Uh, uh, presumably. Uh, but I don't think we really know how much money is uh, you know, laundered through uh, real estate because some people will set up a shell corporation. Uh, they will use their corporate accounts uh, to acquire real estate assets assets, um, you know, and, and real estate is just one aspect of money laundering in Canada. I mean, you know, as Sasha talked about, it occurs through capital markets, it occurs through wealth management. Well, let me follow up on that. Okay, Sasha, have you ever done it before, laundered money? <laughs> no, I haven't. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh. Well, but, but I bet you know how to do it. So let me ask you, just give us a for instance, give us the sort of money laundering 101 example, the most basic example of how you would take dirty money and launder it to make it clean. Sure. So let, let's take the simplest example. Um, so let's say if there was um, if there was a drug trafficker and they ship these drugs across the United States, it would come back as bulk cash. Uh, this bulk cash can then be deposited into ATMs underneath the threshold that would trigger a suspicious transaction report. Which is what? $10,000. Okay. So you can deposit this money across multiple ATMs at night. Then, uh, once that money is deposited, you can then uh, instruct, uh, you can write a check to uh, various nominees who might be within your network. 
And then in turn, those nominees can then send an electronic funds transfer um, uh, to a variety of shell corporations or businesses um, or even other accounts in various jurisdictions. And then that's how the money ends up being integrated. Dirty money going in, clean money coming out. Correct. But if you did this, okay, if you can do as much as $10,000, so I guess that means $9,999.99. <laughs> it's been done before. <laughs> before anybody takes. But if you're doing this at 3 in the morning at an ATM, and they've all got cameras on right now, can you really get away with it? Well, th this is the this is the the, uh, the, the, the tricky situation, I, and I think uh, Rita described this quite well. Um, so anything can be seen as suspicious, and it's up to um, the uh, AML teams inside financial institutions to under to look at patterns and to understand uh, to what extent they might suspect money laundering activities, and to what extent is uh, a probability of money laundering. Hmm. Um, so, for instance, if each transaction was nine thousand nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine dollars all at three o'clock in the morning at a certain ATM I think that's a big red flag that's a big red flag okay <laughs> fair enough all right well let's take something maybe um, a little less obvious mark do you want to give us your favorite example maybe not drug money but something else how people launder money uh well, uh, they would be using ATM machine, but Bitcoin ATM machine, because there is Bitcoin ATM machine, which is mm. way easier. Or if you're very, very lazy and you want to make it like a one-shot deal, but don't have time to go to the ATM, you just transfer the money to your lawyer trust account. It's your totally lawyer's protected. trust no account? No one knows where the money comes. Yeah, exactly. Huh. Lawyers have trust account. No one can actually look into it. The lawyers are the keys, they're the enablers. So basically, you transfer the money to the lawyer's trust account, and there we go. No one can actually ask where the money comes from because but, it's in the trust account. We cannot touch it. But Mark, I thought lawyers are not permitted to participate in criminal activity. They if just they don't know. If they're aware of. So they just if don't ask says, questions. Well, if someone says, I come from another country, I made money over there, and here I am, I want to invest in Canada, I want you to be my nominee, I'll transfer the money to your uh, trust account, there we go. Rita, should there That's be a issue. greater... It was actually pointed out in the, in the Cullen report, not as clear as I did, but still, mm -hmm. like, because being a CPA, I have the same issues. Now with CPAs, it's different, we need to report, and if we're acting as nominees, we need to report it, but we don't have a trust account, while lawyers do. So that's why so many people say the Canadian Bar Association need to step up and do something, because right now there is a lot of professionals that are actually enablers. They're paid millions to launder billions, basically. Huh. Okay, Rita, I was just gonna ask you that. Should there be an obligation, as apparently there is on accountants, on lawyers as well, to ask some questions about, hey, where's all that money coming from? Absolutely, and I've written about this topic. So the reason that lawyers don't have an obligation is that there was a 2015 Supreme Court of Canada ruling that said um, that FinTrack's old obligations for lawyers uh, would sub, you know, uh, subject the lawyers to unreasonable search and seizure. However, they left the door open for Parliament to rewrite the legislation and the reporting requirements in such a way that would be uh, compliant with the Charter, and other countries have done it, such as the UK. There has been a huge pushback from the legal profession in Canada. They don't want to have to have these extra uh, obligations put onto them. They quite like having, the law societies quite like having, you know, the self-regulation aspect. There were new money laundering regulations put into uh, place by the law society in Ontario, as an example. And they basically said, okay, while you have to, you know, write down the source of funds for your client when they retain you for the retainer, you don't have to verify the accuracy of the information. So what's the point? Oh, and you know, you may have to do some monitoring, but it doesn't have any specifics on you know when and how often. So it's it's far too loosey goosey. And you know, the law societies, if you know, they would if they had their way, it would continue to be self-regulation. But any profession that doesn't want to have scrutiny from a third party is you know opening themselves up to all sorts of abuse. Hmm. All right, we got five minutes to go here, and let's kick around a few more ideas. We've talked about some ideas already to tighten things up and make sure authorities are able to get to the bottom of all this. Sasha, a beneficial ownership registry. What is that? 
So a beneficial ownership registry uh, is a tool that allows um, someone to understand who the ultimate owner of a company or property might be. Uh, beneficial ownership registries have been rolled out in 110 countries worldwide. Is Canada one of them? So Canada has made a commitment to a publicly accessible beneficial ownership registry in budget 2022. Uh, the, the target date for implementation is 2023. Uh, our coalition uh, have been advocating for a public registry since 2017. And um, we're we're on the horizon of, of, of seeing it come to fruition. This, this, is, this could be a big milestone for Canada. Um, the, the challenge for a federated jurisdiction like ours is the division of powers between the federal government and all the provinces. Uh, so the thing that we really need is we need for the Canadian government to announce an agreement with all provinces and territories to centralize this beneficial ownership information, make it publicly accessible, and make it free to access. You know it's never going to happen, right, Sasha? You know, <laughs> Quebec is never going to go for it. You right. know what? Quebec has already uh, leaped ahead. Uh, they made uh, their beneficial ownership information already public. Um, at least they've committed to it, and it's uh, it's um, being currently being implemented. So uh, Quebec already happens to have a publicly accessible business registry, and they're simply adding beneficial ownership information into that business registry itself. But for Quebec? Just for Quebec. They're not going to join a national registry, would they? You know what? I think they would because I th there's they've already done it. And there's already a precedent that's set, and Canada could, can simply follow Quebec's example. This beneficial ownership registry, Mark, is this something you think Quebec could sign on to? Oh, for sure. For sure. They would be very interested. They already have something in place, and uh, they would be more interested to, to integrate it with the uh, federal uh, government, for sure. Now, we know that they haven't signed on to other national efforts at financial regulation. <laughs> Why do you think they'd sign on to this one? Uh, it's because of their reputation. Uh, for a long time, people always said that uh, Quebec was the most corrupted province in Canada, which was not the case, but still. So now they, uh, they're they really leading by efforts. And they have been caring a lot about corruption and money laundering for a while. So for them, they're already at that stage to, to that, that they're ready to integrate whatever, whatever they have in place with uh, a federal agency, for sure. Sasha, do you think at the end of the day that could really make a difference? Oh, for sure. Um, you know, um, having a beneficial ownership registry that's publicly accessible uh, has been a recommendation uh, made by experts um, and uh, international uh, jurisdictions have put pressure on Canada. Um, there have been conversations between finance ministers um, urging Canada to act in this regard. And so if you have a registry that's world class, that's publicly accessible, free of cost, that would deter the volume of dirty money that would be entering the country. And there's also an opportunity for provinces to create uh, beneficial ownership property registries. And we're seeing some movement on this at the municipal level. There are some uh, mayoral candidates, Stephen Punwasi, for instance, who's calling upon beneficial ownership disclosure for businesses that are seeking uh, licenses and permits uh, at, at, you know, from the city of Toronto. So that's, that's quite exciting. Is he running for mayor of Toronto? He is. I have not heard that name before. Okay. <laughs> Say that name again. Stephen Punwasi. You're working on his campaign? Well, I am volunteering, yes. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Didn't know that. Um, okay, Rita, one last thing here, and that is, I presume this is all beyond the knowledge of most local police forces or even the RCMP. Is that fair to say these guys can't crack down on this? I mean, we don't have a very good record on prosecuting right. um, uh, this type of financial crime. So the RCMP were put in a terrible position. I mean, you know, successive federal governments have underfunded them. And again, the RCMP can only wor work with what they have. And in 2012, they shut down their National Proceeds of Crime and Commercial Crime Unit, which is the very unit that looks at money laundering and investigates these crimes. And they took a five-year holiday from prosecuting white collar crime on the thought that, okay, well, you know, the provincial police forces where they exist and uh, local police will pick up the slack. That didn't happen. And, you know, they've been trying to rebuild their expertise, um, you know, ever since 2017. And this is a problem that predates, obviously, the federal uh, liberal government. Uh, I'm very critical of the federal liberal, liberal government in my columns for, you know, not paying attention to this issue. But this problem actually started with the conservatives who are supposed to be about law and order. Gotcha. Uh, Mark Tasse in the nation's capital, we thank you for joining us tonight. Rita Tritcher, Sasha Caldera, thanks so much to the three of you for being with us on TVO tonight. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.
50 years ago right now, Canadians were having a collective heart attack. Our hockey heroes on Team Canada were supposed to finally prove that we were the best in the world at our game. But after five games, the NHL All-Stars only had one victory, and things looked quite hopeless. We have three guests tonight, all of whom will take us back to what is still the greatest hockey series ever played. In Montreal, Quebec, Robbie Hart, director of the documentary Icebreaker, the 1972 Summit Series. And here in our studio, Gary J. Smith, author of Ice War Diplomat, Hockey Meets Cold War Politics at the 1972 Summit Series. And Scott Morrison is here. He is author of 1972, the series that changed hockey forever. Robbie, it's great to have you there at uh, Trudeau Airport where your flight just landed. We're glad you're uh, beaming into us here on Zoom and you two guys here in the studio, it's great to see you as well. Gary, I want to start with you because I want you to put this series into context. Our best players and their best players had been unable to play against each other for a whole bunch of reasons at this time. And I guess there was a feeling in Canada that it was enough of sending not our best to world championships and we really needed a chance to prove that we were the best. So how did this series start to percolate in the first place? Well, Steve, you know, we last won the Olympics in 1952 with the Edmonton Mercuries and the World Championships last victory for Canada, 1961, Trail Smoke Eaters. We tried and tried and we couldn't beat the Russians because we couldn't put our best on the ice. Because they were in the NHL. In the NHL and they were professionals. Mm -hmm. And the Russians, even though the Russians were part of the Red Army, or the Red Air Force, the Soviet police and so on, they were categorized as amateurs. Hmm. And the Olympic Committee and the International Ice Hockey Federation said, no, 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 they're amateurs, you're professionals, they can't play. So how did we get around that? And we got around it because of the political context, Pierre Trudeau and Kosygin wanted to have better relations between Canada and the Soviet Union. And therefore, we signed a general exchanges agreement with sportsmen, and that enabled me to uh, do what I could on the diplomatic front in Moscow. Because you were our guy in Moscow. I was in Moscow as a junior diplomat, mm -hmm. and we were able to say, all right, let's have an exhibition series, just Canada and the Soviet Union. And that took it away from the IIHF context. We weren't going to say who was professional or who was amateur. It wasn't going to be for any trophies. There were no trophies in this series. It was just going to be the best on best. In fact, Scott, they called it a friendship series, although it wasn't too friendly. That became pretty obvious pretty quickly. What was at stake here beyond bragging rights for hockey? Well, I mean, the world and I was going to say a different place, but, but it's really not that different now with what's been happening obviously with the with the Russians but you know at the time with the Cold War going on uh, there was very much this us versus them attitude the lead item on the the nightly news was about an American and a, and a Soviet playing chess Spassky and Bobby oh, yeah. Fischer it was all of the bragging rights that you got to boast about your political system your way of life that your system was better than our system sports was a big vehicle for that and that's what this became that because in the beginning as you mentioned it was supposed to be this friendly it was going to be in our eyes a walkover for the Canadians eight straight wins and they're all going to be lopsided because we were we we're going to show this greatness of our hockey and then it became something much different it was great in a much different way that nobody could have imagined going into that series and the politics of the day became a big part of a, the backdrop of it well Robbie it was supposed to be four games in four different Canadian cities and then four games in Moscow. And after game one started, Canada went out to a 2-0 lead almost immediately. We had a 2-0 lead within six minutes. They ended up losing the game 7-3, blown away. What was the big takeaway from that first game? Well, in the film, actually, you have uh, the esteemed and uh, very intelligent and wise Brian Conacher saying that after that game one, September the 2nd, 1972, hockey in the world changed forever. That's a line I remember hearing in the interview, and, and it stands true to this day. Uh, you know, I think all of us woke up the next day on September the 3rd, 1972, realizing that there were other people playing hockey and playing it at a very high level, and they were also playing it differently. And um, it was an eye-opener. It was a game-changer. And it, it, I often say, 
to people when they say, what do you take away from the Summit Series? Well, the great winner was neither Canada nor the Soviet Union. The great winner was the game of hockey. Hmm. How big a problem, Scott, was the fact that the Soviet players had played together, drafted into the Army. They played together all year long. They knew each other very well. Ours was an, a team basically of NHL All-Stars put together at the last minute. And beyond that, the guys didn't like each other very much, right? No, it was much different back in the day. You had players from 10 different teams. And if you played for Toronto, you didn't like the guys from Montreal. If you were the Rangers, you didn't like the Bruins and et cetera, et cetera. So it took a while for that team to come together. And it really wasn't until they got over to Sweden after the first four games that they started to bond and they realized that okay, we don't, I don't like you, you don't like me, but we're playing for this crest and our mm. pride is on the line. Our national pride, but also the pride of us as hockey players. We had two big problems, Gary. Bobby Orr, maybe the best player in the world at the time, was injured, couldn't play, and Bobby Hull was not allowed to play. What happened there? Well, Orr, as you said, had undergone knee surgery, but he was part of the team. He traveled everywhere with the team, including in Moscow, but never played. Bobby Hull uh, got caught up in the politics between the NHL and the new league, the uh, World Hockey Association. And the players who left to go to the World Hockey Association, including Hull, signed a million-dollar contract, right? The million-dollar man. Mm. And the NHL said... All those guys are excluded, Jerry Cheevers, uh, J.C. Trombley, and so on. So we did not field our best, actually. And Pierre Trudeau, the prime minister, went to Clarence Campbell, the president of the NHL, begged for Bobby Hull to play, and? They said no. <laughs> they said no. <laughs> How do you say no to the prime minister? Well, because it's a business deal, right? And they said that was the deal they had with Hockey Canada. NHL, Hockey Canada, you had to have a contract signed with the NHL by the time of the opening of training camp, hmm. August 13, at Maple Leaf Gardens. Because you have to keep in mind, the, the owners of the American NHL teams, they wanted no part of this series. Canada versus Ru Soviets, they didn't care. So to get their blessing, it had to be you can't allow the WHA to come into it and allow those players to be showcased. Well, let's remember here. Game one, we get killed in Montreal. Game two, we win in Toronto at Maple Leaf Gardens. Game three in Winnipeg, we blow a two-goal lead, ends up a tie. Twice we blew a two-goal lead. And in Vancouver for game four, we get booed off the ice. Our guys are booed mercilessly off the ice, and Phil Esposito gave what is widely perceived to be just an incredible interview. Uh, with Johnny Esau after the game was over. Sheldon, we got a snippet of that we can play for everybody here. Let's have a look. Every one of us guys, 35 guys that came out and played for Team Canada, we did it because we love our country and not for any other reason, no other reason. They can throw the money uh, for the pension fund out the window. They can throw anything they want out the window. We came because we love Canada. And even though we play in the United States and we earn money in the United States, Canada is still our home and that's the only reason we come. And I don't think it's fair that we should be booed. Robbie, talk to us about that speech. Uh, Phil was really wearing his heart on his sleeve there. Did it have an impact on the team? Well, it, it had an impact on the team and it also had an impact on the nation. I mean, I think uh, Canadians that heard that speech uh, realized that the players were speaking from their heart and that they really did care about the result and that they were actually facing very tough competition. You have to remember that the Soviets had been playing and practicing for 11 months. Team Canada only got together in August and we're not really up to speed yet to, to, to where the Soviets were. So it's true that by the time they got to Sweden and Moscow, they had already been out training and playing almost six weeks and were able to pick it up. And, you know, we often say that that speech, Espo's speech was like Canada's Gettysburg Address or, or you know, a, a Kennedy speech about what you can do for your country. Hmm. And uh, he really did rally, uh, rally the country and he rallied the nations. And it wasn't something that was planned. It came from the heart. Now, Scott, what was interesting about that is lots of Canadians saw that speech. How many of the players on the team actually saw that speech? I don't think any of them did. They weren't aware of it. And obviously, you didn't have social media like you have today. And, uh, you know, the players talked about it the next day. It wasn't on the news cycle or anything like that. So they weren't really aware of it. Phil came into the room and told the guys that he really let loose on national TV and and told, told everybody off, for lack of a better term. And uh, uh, so I don't know how much of an impact it had on the team itself, but I agree with Robbie. It had, a, I think, a huge impact on the fans because when they got to, uh, to Moscow, I mean, they were greeted with 10,000 
telegrams and postcards and greetings and of course the 3,000 fans who are real difference makers there. I was in Vancouver for, I saw all uh, eight games and the four in Canada. I traveled with the Soviet team. Nobody was watching Phil Esposito after that match. Nobody so, who was with the team? Nobody with the Soviet team or with the Canadian team. And none of us around the, uh, the game saw that speech. It was only afterwards that it made an impact. And you know, just to scroll back to Montreal for a minute, our guys were out of shape. Right? During summer, they said the exercise was uh, getting in at 6 a.m. to your hotel, <laughs> not starting to run or rolling the, uh, you know, the window down on your car. That was your exercise. <laughs> and then Harry uh, in Montreal. Harry put, Sinden, the coach. Harry Sinden, the coach, yeah. He only put five defensemen out, and the Russians had seven defensemen. It was a super hot day, super hot day. And our guys tired out, lack of training, mm. drinking beer which you never do uh, these days, you know, nothing about diet. So we were at a big disadvantage. And as Scott said, these were guys from Montreal, Toronto. They didn't like each other. So coming out of Vancouver, uh, we were down, had lost two, one tied and only one victory, heading to big ice, big ice. The European ice and, is wider. Yeah, wider. Mm -hmm. And European referees as well from the double IH. Who were not very good. Well, uh, but they weren't just physically behind too. They were mentally behind because mm -hmm. they went to that with the attitude that this was going to be a cakewalk. And all of a sudden you get the shocker of opening night in Montreal and then the pressure of a nation that felt betrayed by how they were playing. Mm -hmm. To your point, Gary, is that when they got to Vancouver, that emotion was spilling over from the fan base. So they were feeling all that heat as well. So back in the day, these guys worked in the summer. They worked on their farms if they were from rural communities. Or, or they had hockey, hockey camps, schools yeah. where they worked. Yeah. They were frontmen, pitchmen, <clears throat> excuse me, for breweries and that type of thing. Mm. Summer wasn't for training. Summer was for <laughs> earning money. Well, one thing waiting for them, and we're going to pull another snippet here out of Robbie's documentary. One thing waiting for them when they left Canada and went to Moscow were 3,000 Canadians who uh, somehow decided it was more important to go over there and cheer for these guys than boo them at the end of the game in Vancouver. Uh, okay, Sheldon, let's see a snippet of this. The Team Canada Rooters over here come up with a new cheer, Foster. It's called Da Da Canada, Yet Yet Soviet. I kept saying to myself, Da Da Canada, and Yet Yet Soviet. And this thing filled the arena. To the point the stolid Russians would look around and, and think, my God, what are, who are these people? And how do they get away with this? And here were these people who had no reverence whatsoever, yelling and screaming. The Soviets, their big chant was shy boo, shy boo, shy boo, which was the puck, uh, kind of an inanimate yell. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Robbie, how is it that those 3,000 fans managed to shame the, whatever it was, 11 or 12,000 Russian fans into submission in their own building? Well, the Russian fans aren't really actually used to cheering and roaring and displaying, you know, uh, emotion. I mean, it, it, it wasn't the communist way of being, of, of behavior. And uh, here you go, you got all these crazy Canucks, 3,000 of them in reds and whites with flags, standing and cheering and getting caught up in the whole passion of the summit series. And um, it, it really it really was a, a, a difference maker inside Luzhniki, uh, you know, arena. And you have to remember that four of the eight games were played on that same surface, uh, unlike Montreal, Toronto, Winnipeg, and Vancouver, where so you had this 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 synergy that, that developed in that building. And half the series, 50% was played in that building in, with those fans cheering and, and supporting and, and, and pushing them on, and it did make a difference. There actually weren't uh, Russian hockey fans because a Russian hockey fan couldn't get a ticket. <laughs> there was the central committee meeting that was held during that first game, and those functionaries got the tickets. So they're all sitting on their hands. And Brezhnev, after that, he's, he was there for game one in Moscow. The Soviet general yes, secretary. Yes, Soviet general secretary. sees all these Canadians yelling and screaming with flags and all the Russians sitting on their hands in brown and black. So he orders the sports committee to drum up some supporters. So young women from the sports committee get out there and start the cheer of Shaibu Shaibu. And, you know, Robert Lewis says it's an inanimate object, but <laughs> in Russian, it's a dative case. So puck means to the goal, means goal. And that was their chant against Dada Canada, Nyet Nyet Soviet.
And you know, every Canadian player you talk to about that series, the one thing they all mention is after game five, when they blew the lead. They lost again, game five. They lost First again. Game now you've got to run the table yep. to win the series. But when they left the ice after that game five, dejected, heartbroken, the 3,000 fans stood and cheered them. And that made a difference? And that made a difference. How so? It just, it, they felt like they were playing for the country. They hmm. finally felt the affection of the fan base. So well, much different than the Vancouver experience. For sure. So game five ends in a loss. Game six, however, we win. Paul Henderson of the Maple Leafs scores the winning goal. Game seven, we win. Paul Henderson of the Maple Leafs scores the winning goal. So it's all tied up going into game eight. Shall we cue the great voice of Foster Hewitt here? Go ahead, Foster, take it away. The air in the Moscow arena here is tense as we get ready for this eighth and final game of the series. the final game all tied up so if you've been writing the script it couldn't have produced a more dramatic and exciting final tonight we are making hockey history and the teams and fans are really up for this one Robbie we saw a couple of faces of Soviet hockey players there at the end of that clip you managed to get some guys from the Soviet Union who played in that game in that series to talk to you how do they regard this series 50 years later well, the three in question are, are Vladislav Tretiak, the legendary goaltender, uh, Mikhailov, the captain of the team, or one of the uh, Soviet leaders, and uh, Alexander Yakushev. So you have three legendary Soviet Russian players that were in 72. They uh, look back at it uh, as one of the greatest moments of their careers. And even though they lost, they all say to, the, to this day that it remains a, a friendship with Canada because of that hockey series and that hockey was the big winner that they learned something from, from, from us and that we learned something from them. And uh, you, you look at that game eight, and I had them watching the opening minutes on the screen there, and they're standing there stoically listening to it, and they, they, they had sheer tears in their eyes. And they, they were very touched, and they were very welcoming to us as well very while nice. we were in Moscow. Gary, you were at game eight. Who'd you watch it with? I was at game eight. I watched it with Bobby Orr for the first period, and then uh, I was down at the bench. And lo and behold, we're down 5-3 after the second period. And who shows up in the arena but the uh, prima ballerina from the Bolshoi, Maya Plitsetskaya. And the night before, Team Canada had gone to the ballet to see Anna Karenina, and the players in ballet don't really go together. But Phil got up on his feet after uh, the first act and started yelling, oh, bravo, bravo. And she says, who's that? That's Phil Esposito from the Canadian team. So she shows up between the second and third period and says, I want to speak to Phil. <laughs> and she wishes him the best of luck. And he became Hercules on ice for the third period. And the Russian cultural community blamed her for the Soviet team's loss. Oh, for goodness sakes. All right, Scott, I want you to put us in the dressing room after the second period because we're Canada's down 5-3. Looks like a hopeless guy. The Soviet team has never lost a game leading by two goals going into the, thir into the third period. What's happening in the dressing room? There was calm. They had a confidence. Uh, they felt better about their game. They, they, after the disappointment of Game 5, as, as heartbroken as they were, they felt that they were finally coming together as a team. They shrunk the roster. Uh, their conditioning had gotten better. Their confidence level was better. And so it grew, game six, game seven. And as bad as they felt after those two periods, there was still a real confidence level there. And Harry Sinden, the coach, told the team, he said, don't go out and try to win the game in the first five minutes because we'll give up a goal. Hmm. He says, get one, and then we'll just keep chipping away. And when it gets to the final five minutes, we're going hell-bent for leather to win this game, whether it's we're behind or we're tied, and that's what they did. We got well, uh, actually, Phil scored in, uh, pretty soon yeah. into the third period to take us to 5-4. to four. And don't forget, uh, I was talking to a Soviet official, and I said, wouldn't it be a lovely diplomatic solution 
an outcome to this series if it ends in a tie. So then we each have three victories and two ties. He said, no, no, Gary, we win because we score one goal more. So I told that to Al Eagleson, and he told it to Harry and the players. So they knew they had to have three goals in the third period to win, not just two. So Phil digs deep. Maybe it's the ballerina, maybe not. Maybe it's the incentive <laughs> to, uh, you know, show that we're going to get those goals. So he, he scores... He assists Cornway after the break because in international hockey, you change ends right after 10 after minutes. After 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah, and Cornway scores. And then we have the incident of the goal light not coming on. Right. We, we score a goal and the light doesn't come on. And Eagleson is convinced that there's some kind of communist conspiracy here, right? Yes. And what happens? All hell breaks loose, Scott. Well, Eagleson goes charging to the scorer's table and uh, encounters the Soviet military and police and everybody else, and he's getting roughed up, and the Canadians leave the bench en masse. Even the guys in the suits are charging across the ice, and Peter Mahovlich jumps the boards, and he basically rescues them from the, uh, from the soldiers. And as Peter said later, he says, wasn't the smartest thing I've ever did. They had guns. I had a hockey stick. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, at anybody who's of a certain age is never going to forget the clip that we're about to show next. Last minute of the game, it's tied 5-all. Sheldon, you're on. I remember last minute, Ivan Sonoye, good pass. And Vasily, big mistake. <laughs> Vasily stay like this to keep the puck. He goes this way. Ivan Kurnaya top the park. Four hands and come to, to come like this. Here's a shot. Henderson made a wild stab for spell. They make a pass, shoot, they make a save. Here's another shot. Right by the door. Henderson scores for Canada. Henderson scores for Canada. <laughs> John Diefenbaker there. I don't know about you guys. I'm overclimped right now hearing that again. We've seen that a thousand times. It still goes right through you. Robbie, I got to ask you, though. You've got the goaltender who gave up three goals in the third period, Vladislav Tretiak, on the ice 50 years later, going through it play-by-play -play for your cameras. How did you convince Tretiak to do that? But that's one of those magic golden moments that you get in documentary cinema that you can't really script uh, or presume it's going to happen, but it did. I mean, Mr. Chechek was terribly um, uh, uh, open and generous with his feelings, his emotions, and, and his access. And uh, I, we were standing right there, and I said, you know, there, there you were 50 years ago. Please tell me what happened. And he went into this ex explanation of how that goal came about. And uh, it's history, and I think I'm the only person in the world to have gotten that story. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty cool moment. It is a very cool moment. Well, the, the interesting thing, I was with Robbie uh, when that was being mm -hmm. shot in Moscow last September, and you'll see that Trajak's speaking English there. Yes. Broken English, which he never does. He's always speaking in Russian, but mm -hmm. that adds to that, uh, you know, lovely, lovely, lovely scene. Scott, the one question that I think nobody has been able to resolve over the years is, Paul Henderson was a very good hockey player, but he certainly wasn't one of the best hockey players in the world at the time. He scores the winning goal in games six, seven, and eight, and would have had the winning goal in game five had Team Canada not collapsed. How do you explain that? I think, you know, Paul was a, to, to be named to that roster, you had to be a very good player to begin with. Um, and he came to camp. He was one of the few. He, Bobby Clark, and Ron Ellis, who were a, a line, and the only line that stayed together from start to finish. But they came to camp in shape. And they came to camp determined to make that team and to uh, have an impact. And so I think they were probably better prepared than most of the players on the Canadian roster. And, you know, Paul just, he'll say, I can't explain how all of a sudden I took my game to another level. But think about this, Steve, is that in game five, he crashed into the boards and suffered a concussion. Right. He was told by the medical staff and Harry Sinden, take your gear off, you're done. And he begged Harry, he said, Harry, it, it can't end this way. I've got to get out and play. He had a special feeling about himself mm -hmm. and the impact he could have in that series. And he and John Ferguson had a talk leading up to that fifth game where Fergie said, if we're going to win this thing, you're going to have to be a special player. 
And he was. And he sure was. But the also, uh, Steve, uh, that was big ice. Mm -hmm. And Henderson could fly. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was a big advantage. So he really came into his own with the... Uh, the big ice, and he admits, he says, that that was a garbage goal, game yeah. eight. <laughs> game seven, his goal, he goes around two Soviet forwards and two defensemen who are bringing him down, and he scores the winning goal there, and he admits, and and seeing it myself in person, goal, his goal in game seven really was the top. Robbie, we're down to our last minute and change here, and i got to ask you, you know, had this series gone the way that most Canadians thought it would go, eight straight wins, my hunch is we're not talking about it 50 years later. The fact that it came down to the last 34 seconds, in hindsight, maybe it's better it was so hard, eh? What do you think? Of course. I mean, it, 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 when it began, no one would have predicted where it would have been 27 days later. I mean, you're looking at a whole month of September from the 2nd to the 28th. And during those 27 days, you couldn't script uh, the story. You couldn't actually predict how this would roll out. And it's a Hollywood story. You can't write it. I mean, but it happened. And it, it's, it's as I say, the game of hockey was the big winner because it, all of us learned. It took hockey to another level. And um, Canadians also discovered a sense of national identity, uh, which is a big part of the film. Uh, there was a sense of pride and a sense of unity, regardless of what province you came from or your age or your, or your language. Canadians rallied behind that experience. And it was a singular, a seminal moment in our history. And that's one of the things... Uh, I think the film brings to light. I just happen to have here, I went through the attic the other day. <laughs> Sheldon, can you get a shot of that? I was 12 years old, and those are my two tickets for game two at Maple Leaf Gardens in Toronto that Canada won four to one. Peter Mahovlich scoring the most gorgeous shorthanded goal I've ever seen in my life. Here's a couple of old tickets from the gardens as well. I'm not sure I had as good a seat as you did, Gary, but I was in the building with my brother and my parents and I can still choke up talking about that series. It was just the greatest. With all apologies to Sidney Crosby and the Golden Goal and Gretzky to Lemieux, am I right? It's still the greatest series Absolutely. ever. Absolutely. And it'll never be replicated. You got that right. I mean, Gentlemen. Gretzky says in the film, Gretzky says in the film, it was the greatest hockey that was ever played just before the title. Yes, he uh, is. And that's in the opening third minute of the film. So if it's coming from Wayne directly, we know it's got to be true. You betcha. That's Robbie Hart. Go see Icebreaker, the 1972 Summit Series, a fantastic documentary on the events of 50 years ago. Uh, Gary J. Smith, Ice War Diplomat, Scott Morrison, 1972, the series that changed hockey forever. Thanks so much, guys, for this walk down memory lane. It was brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. And that is the agenda for Thursday, September 22nd, 2022. Tomorrow, J.N. Jagannathan gets an update on the risks associated with Russia's targeting of Ukraine's energy grid. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org. And J.N., we'll see you here tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.